In this video, we're going to continue to work with our Ferrari 308 surface, and we're going to build out the wheel opening using Fusion 360 surfaces. <laughs> Hey everyone, this is Matt with Learn Everything About Design, and in this video, we're going to carry on with the surface we created in the last video. If you had any difficulties, you can go to the description of the video and download the data set. So what we did in the last video was we built out the outside portion of the surface and an intermediate guide rail using 2D sketches projected into 3D. So what we did in those cases was we used our 2D sketches and we projected them from the top and the side until we had a 3D curve. Now, this is a very common workflow and it gives us a lot of control over the sketches at the 2D level. If we're careful with the endpoints and how we build out these control structures, we can build complex shapes using just those 2D sketches. However, you probably noticed in Fusion 360 and if you're using things like Inventor, you have to build out a third sketch to capture that intersection curve. This is not true in all CAD software, but it is true for Fusion 360 and Inventor. So what we're going to talk about today is how to continue working with this surface, how to blend out the outside portion of our fender, and how to potentially use 3D sketches to help us along the way. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to talk about what we have here on the screen and our first starting point. So when we look at the surface we created, we have this surface, and I'm going to make sure that I am in perspective with ortho to make sure that we are seeing this properly over our blueprint. This middle section of the Ferrari 308 is unique in the fact that we don't have surface continuity going all the way down the body. It sort of is broken at the midline. This can be for various reasons. It could be a stylized effect. It could be because the upper and the lower portions of the car were built as individual fiberglass pieces or aluminum panels or whatever the case might be. It works in our benefit because it means that we don't have to worry so much about curvature continuity going from the top to the bottom. However, we do want to maintain some consistency in the way that we design our parts. So the first thing that I want to do is I'm going to create a sketch on the side plane. I'm going to use P for projection to project the front and the back edge. And I'm going to use my line tool or L on the keyboard to draw a horizontal line. Now over here on the left hand side, I don't want to draw a horizontal line to snap to the midpoint. I simply want to make it coincident with that edge. Now, in this case, you'll notice that it went a bit crazy, and that's because I have 3D sketches turned on. When you have 3D sketches turned on, your sketch is potentially unconstrained in all three directions. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that we don't have 3D sketches turned on. We have a horizontal edge, and we simply drag it up until it's in approximately the right location. Then what I want to do is use split body. And I want to use split body instead of trim because I want to keep this piece. I don't want to get rid of it like I would with using the trim tool. So if we take a look at the bodies folder, we now have this midline. I'm going to go ahead and rename it. And then we have the fender. And this is just body two right now, but I'm going to call this fender. With the midline, I want to keep and maintain it in case I need it later. So I'm going to use control C, control V to copy and paste in the exact same location. You could also go into your surface tools and create an offset with a zero distance, and it would do the same exact thing. Both of them are going to put a feature in the timeline. So whether you copy paste or you create an offset really doesn't matter in this case because they're going to give you the same result. So now that we have this midline, we need to think about the pieces of it that we want in order to create our fender. Now, the blueprints for this are a little bit funky because from the front, we can obviously see that the fender comes out and it's pretty much straight above the wheel. However, when we look at this from the top, we don't get that same impression. It doesn't really flare out. It appears that it's sort of sunken into this body line. Now, that's not the case on the real car. It does flare out. So we need to sort of make a decision what that means for our curvature and our geometry. So once again, this is a case where if you have really good references and really good input, it can make a whole load of difference. So we're going to move forward with it, considering the fact that it's not going to be quite right, but we are going to simply push on building out this section. So we're going to create a sketch on the side. Once again, 3D Sketches is currently turned off, and I'm going to start by projecting this bottom edge, so P on the keyboard, 
And I'm gonna use my line tool to make a vertical line where I expect the center point of this to be. And I'm gonna just use the fix unfix to lock it in place and then turn it into construction. For something like a wheel well, a fender arch, whatever you wanna call it, this oftentimes, at least at the portion where we're dealing with it, is going to be an arc or relatively close to an arc. So you can see here, if I snap to that vertical line and I sort of pull these around to the outside section of this little lip, it looks like it fits pretty well. We know that these endpoints are horizontal and we know that we're attached to approximately the center of the wheel, which is going to be the center of that shape. Then I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna offset it inward now, in most cases, when I'm working on designs, when it makes sense, I will fully define the sketch. For parametric designs that are mechanical, 100%, you wanna make sure that your sketches are fully defined. With something like this, when I'm designing a car or working with complex surfaces, when the shape is more organic, I generally will leave some portions of the sketches underdefined. It just depends on the design. In this instance, let's go ahead and finish the sketch. And now what I wanna do is I want to get just the small pieces of that lip of the fender that I want to keep. Now those areas are going to be required and the outside pieces and the inside can go away. So this is where using something like trim makes sense because I can select that outside curve and I can get rid of these outside pieces if I don't need them. Remember we did save a copy so we do still have that original surface. And again if we were to use something like split body then we'd have to go back and we would have to remove these from our design. So in this case, trim makes the most sense. I'm gonna temporarily hide the canvases and just take a look at what we have. So now we have these little pieces here and we want to build out what is essentially going to be that flat section of our fender. So here is where things start to get complicated. When we go back to our sketch that we used as a trim, that sketch, comes all the way down to the bottom of this surface. And because of the way that we created these surfaces, we know that the upper portion of the fender and this piece are tangent. They have continuity across that edge because we split them up. And we will also know that this curve is going to hit this point. If we go to our top view and we project this edge, which again is shared between those two pieces, and we project this opening out into 3D, we will have a curve that intersects at that point and we can use it for something like a loft. However, the curve will extend down to the bottom, which means we can't use it for a surface like a patch. Those endpoints of any section of a patch need to all be connected. So what does this mean for us designing a part like this in 3D? Well, the first inclination might be to go to something like a 3D sketch and maybe use a spline, which is going to be very tricky for us to control the shape. So I'm actually gonna do this in two steps and we can kind of see the difference. So the first step for me, I'm gonna go ahead and create another sketch on the right plane. And what I wanna do is I wanna project the upper edge of these two small pieces here. I'm gonna say, okay. I'm also going to project the outside arc, say, okay. And then I wanna hide sketch 16 and turn this outside arc into construction which means that it's not selectable for things like a loft or extrude or an intersection curve. But then I wanna come back and create another arc that snaps to these points and the midpoint is going to snap to the midpoint of my arc. Now, theoretically, this arc here should be the same as this arc here. So if we make them concentric, for example, they should perfectly match because we know that this arc was continued on and that's what we use to trim these small surfaces. Again, the, these are kind of assumptions that we have to make when we're doing a design like this. Now, the assumption here is that if we create a sketch on the top and we use, again, project include, we're gonna project this bottom edge here. And again, the assumption here is that if we were to project this curve up into this curve, it would exactly match those intersection points here. Now there is one problem. Again, when we're doing these intersection curves in 3D, we need a third sketch. It's kind of unfortunate. That's just the way that the software works. And if we project this up and this over, and we take a look at the result, hiding those two originals, you can see that it does indeed intersect where we want it to. Now the problem that comes from this is that intersection 
does not take into account the curvature direction of that surface. Now it does project it out based on a vertical projection of this bottom edge and a projection of our arc from the side, but that doesn't account for the curvature. And this is where building these curves out in 2D can oftentimes be a little bit more complicated than trying to build it out in 3D. So let's go ahead and start another sketch. Again, with sketches, even if it's 3D, we have to pick a plane. And then we're gonna to toggle on this 3D sketch. Now for the first thing that I wanna do is go to Project Include and Include 3D Geometry. I'm gonna bring in the outside of both of these surfaces, right click and say, okay. And now I'm gonna to try to build out an arc in 3D. I'm gonna start from this point, I'm gonna to go to this point, and I'm gonna to start to pull this arc up. Now you'll notice what happens initially is that arc is laid onto the surface of the fender, the upper portion of the surface. It's just the nature of the way that a 2D arc is gonna be built out in 3D. If I try to come back and apply tangency between the arc and this edge, you can see that it doesn't really give us tangency. Now it's not the result that I was looking for, so I'm gonna do Control Z. I'm gonna to try to do it on the other side, see if we can get a tangent relationship. And you can see again here, it just doesn't quite work in 3D. Now this is one of the inherent problems that we have when dealing with 3D sketches. The 3D sketches are not going to respect the constraints in the same way as a 2D sketch would. So in order to do this, we need to think about how we can build a curve in 3D. We could potentially do things like add a sketch point to this, and then we could move the sketch point using our move tool and potentially move or rotate the spline or the arc. But ultimately, this is just not a good way for us to define these curves in 3D. So let's give it a shot to define a spline in 3D. So we're gonna start from here. I'm gonna just come up somewhere in space. Now I wanna do this from the front view. I'm gonna sort of just put it about where I think it should be. You can see that's not quite at the correct spot, but that's okay. And then my last point is gonna be over here and we'll hit the green check mark. Now, the reason that this is okay is because we can hit escape. We then can select this point, which we know is not in the right location. And we need to use the move tool. Now this is M on the keyboard and I can move this back to where I think it should be approximately. I'm gonna right click and say, okay. Then I'm gonna to try to apply tangency between the spline and this edge that we grabbed. I'm gonna do the same thing over here, spline and this edge. Now we're controlling the tangency direction. And if we look at this thing from the front, we can also see approximately where that curve is going to be. Now, this is not the best example for the use of 3D splines. We'll talk about that in just a second, but we can see that we do have the ability to maintain tangency at the edges. And then we simply need to use the move tool to position this where we want it. Now, the benefit here is that we can go to things like a top view, and we can figure out where we want that curve to be. Once we're happy with that curve, we simply need to just finish our 3D sketch. With this, we can then take the original fender, let's go ahead and hide it temporarily. And I wanna create a loft going from this edge over to this edge. Then I wanna use this rail. And I also wanna make sure that we are carrying that tangency on each of those edges. So you can see here that we're building it out we're using those as rails, and now we've built out this sort of upper portion of that fender in 3D. Remember, we don't need these two little pieces, those midline body pieces aren't needed, because this is ultimately going to attach to our fender. Now, this is one method that we can take. Obviously, there are many other methods. We can use the projected curve, but we are going to have to not use tangency with those little surfaces just because of the nature of the way we're building these curves out in 3D. The next thing that we wanna talk about from here is how we can take this and blend it with the fender. Now, a couple of schools of thought here, we can take this edge and we can use something like a ruled surface. I'm gonna turn off chain selection because I only want this outside edge. We can drag it back. We can add something like a taper if we want to, and we can use that to build out the flare. That's one method that we can do. Another method is for us to use something like a patch or a loft. So before I get started, I want to take both of these, this body and this fender, 
and I'm gonna copy and paste them because I'm gonna use them again in another example. So I'm gonna hide those copies. I'm gonna create a 2D sketch from the side. And with the 2D sketch, I'm gonna turn off 3D sketch. I'm gonna take this outside edge and project it. And then I wanna create the shape that I wanna cut. Now in this case, I'm just gonna use an arc. I'm gonna go from these two points. I wanna make sure that those two points are still there. And I'm going to finish the sketch. Now we don't actually have a good reference for this, so I'm just gonna kind of make it up. But then I wanna trim the surface using this outside arc, removing that inside piece. And then I can hide my sketch. From here, I can use patch. Again, I'm gonna turn off enable chaining because these are two separate surfaces. And I'm gonna allow it to just patch those together. We can stitch them together. And at this point, if you wanna use fillets inside of your surface design, you can come in and you can grab these edges and maybe add a small surface. In this case, there's a chance that the fillets are gonna fail depending on the size that you use. Some cases, a smaller fillet might be okay. You might need a larger fillet. You might not be able to fill it at all. Now, in this case, you can see here that the fillet is uh, failing. It's, it's not working, which means that we would need to take a different approach to blend those together. Now, the reason that that happens oftentimes is because these are ending at a point and it really doesn't know what to do in those corners. In some instances, you might be able to fill it one side first, finish that fillet and come back. In this case, let's go ahead and try this outside edge and see if it allows us to fill it that. If not, then again, we're gonna have to come back and you'd have to do it using surfacing tools and sort of trim away the excess. But let's try this just to see if it works. Try a five millimeter fillet. And you can see doing those two separately allowed it to work. Now that we have that, let's go ahead and bring back those copies and let's look at another method here. So once again, I am gonna create a sketch on the side. This time I am going to project that bottom edge. Once again, I'm gonna use an arc. It doesn't have to be an arc, but in this case, because I know that the outside shape was an arc, I'm gonna just use that as my reference. I'm just gonna build out where I wanna cut the fender. Again, I'm not spending a lot of time fully defining this stuff. We're just working through that, but it does give us the idea or the intent behind how we're building these surfaces out. So now that we have these two, I'm gonna create a loft between them. Now, in this case, I'm gonna go from one edge to the other. I am gonna use uh, tangency or curvature continuity. It really just depends on what your inputs are. And I wanna make sure that I'm aligning the edges. Now, again, in this case, aligning the edges or align to surface, it's gonna produce the same exact result. We did a video talking about that earlier, but it just essentially means that this bottom edge is gonna follow along with the surface. If we turn that off and allow it to be free, a lot of times you're gonna get some pretty interesting results with what happens at those edges. So it's always just a good idea to make sure that you're toggling those on. Next, we need to talk about the shape because that is not very Ferrari. Uh, so what we wanna do is we wanna look at the tangency weight. There is an arrow on the screen where we can manipulate the tangency weight. We can also modify it by changing the tangency weight value and get a little bit of a tighter transition. From here, I'm gonna leave the back one at one and the front one at 0.25. And then I want to stitch all these together. Want to make sure that we do have a green edge where the surfaces intersect. And you can see now that we've blended those together. So now I have two fenders. Let's go ahead and just move this, the most recent one. I'm going to go ahead and just move it off to the right so we can take a look at the differences. Control and four, I'm going to hide the edges. And we can see that the one on the left, and this is the one that had the five millimeter fillet, the one on the right is where we took that outside edge and we blended it up. Now the fillet is going to take away a portion of each surface when we use that as a tool. So they are going to be slightly different in the fact that this one's gonna be up a little bit higher, but the way in which it blends into the rest of the fender is obviously a little bit different. And we can take a look at this by rendering it or, or by rotating it around. And it's just gonna depend on what you want for your design. As a test, let's go ahead and let's try to manipulate the loft. So on that original tangency, we had one. If I take that down to 0.5, it'll tighten that edge up a little bit. We'll say okay. 
And again, you can see that we can sort of manipulate those and get slightly different results. You just kind of have to determine what's best for you. Now the patch in this case was straight between those edges. We could obviously spend a little bit more time trimming things away and blending them with surfaces manually. But ultimately, you have to work on your designs and what you want them to look like. Before we go, the next thing that I, I wanna talk about briefly is I wanna talk about the 3D sketches for the original curve creation. So when we did this, we created all 2D sketches and we projected them out in 3D. Now, for me, this is the sort of the simplest way to approach building these curves out in 3D. Depends on what tool you're using, obviously, but in most parametric CAD programs, 3D spline control can be very tricky especially once you start to add multiple points. So you do wanna follow the same rules where you minimize the number of points that you use, but let's just go through a quick example. I'm gonna create a sketch on the side, I'm gonna to toggle on 3D sketch, and I'm gonna use a fit point spline. Now by default, even in 3D, we are sketching in two dimensions. So there are a couple of schools of thought here. You can build out a cage using points, and then attach to those points. In this case, what I wanna do is I just wanna put a point at the front and the back on the spline, just like we did before. I am going to hit escape to get off my spline creation tool. And while this is still in 2D, we have the ability to control the spline just like we would in 2D. We've activated only the back handle and we've just simply moved the front point around. In order to move this in 3D, I need to select either a point, a point on the handle, or the entire spline, and once again, use the Move Copy tool. I'm gonna to just simply move it out. Remember, this curve is going to be right here. I'm just gonna sort of pull that back, and then I am going to right-click and OK, select the front point, and use M on the keyboard to move it in. Right-click and go to OK. We can still turn on the curvature combs because we're looking at this in 3D, you can see there's a slight curve when we're looking down at it. As we rotate it around or to the front, we're gonna see that that is not in 2D, it's actually curving out. I'm gonna hit cancel because I don't wanna save that. But let's repeat the process by creating a curve for this bottom edge. Now, when we did this from the side, that was a straight line. We can't have a straight line here because it does have some curvature to it. Let's go ahead and pull this back. I have it as a horizontal line for right now. I mean, it's a spline, but it's just drawn as a horizontal line. Again, move copy. I'm gonna sort of pull this out to where it needs to be. And then we want to right click and okay, select this end point, move copy, and sort of pull it in. Right click and okay. And now here is the tricky part. We need to select and activate the handle, use move copy, and then we need to move this to the end of the handle. You can see right now it's moving the entire thing. But what we need to do is we need to actually have it adjust the handle. Now this is the tricky thing because what we want to do is we want to move the handle and we don't want to move the entire spline. So now that the handle is active, I can select that spline point and now move should allow us to actually move the spline handle. And again, this is where doing this in 3D can get a little tricky because it takes a little bit of work and practice to be able to select those. I'm gonna go ahead and just drag that out. Looking from a top-down view means that generally I'm only moving it in two dimensions. We need to do the same thing on this end. I need to activate the handle and I need to try to manipulate the handle. So it looks okay. If we want to, we can toggle on the curvature combs, but for right now, I'm just gonna leave it as is. I am gonna hide the canvases just because it sort of clutters things up a little bit. And once again, I'm gonna create a spline, green check mark, I'm gonna create one back here. And then I'm just gonna create one in the middle somewhere, making sure that I do snap to everything that I want and escape to get off my spline tool. Once again, we need to activate these handles because we are working in 3D, just clicking on them doesn't instantly open up the, uh, the end points. You can see that when I grab it, it's moving the entire curve. So once again, we need to select the handle, we need to activate it, we need to use the move tool, and then once the endpoint is active, then we can use move to start manipulating the handle. So again, it's a little bit more of a clunky workflow, uh, but it is possible, it is something that you can do. You just simply need to activate the handle, 
it's like move and I'm going to cancel again move and it should allow us just clicking on that to activate the handle and then once the handle is active we should be able to move it in 3d so I'm going to go again to a front or back view I think it's always important even when you're working in 3d to do this in a 2d perspective right click and say okay now if you tend to work with curves in 3d often and you have some tips then please let us know add to the comments but i have found that it can be a bit tricky to get these to work in 3d it takes a little bit of practice and playing around being able to activate those so right click and okay and now in a single sketch we have built out the frame for our 3d loft so we're going to loft we'll do the same thing that we did before we're going to go from back to front for our guide rails we use the top and the bottom we'll say okay and now we built out a surface that is very similar if not you know pretty close to exact as our original you can see there are some variations there but using these same exact inputs we could get these same exact results so that is a way that we can use 3d splines and 3d curves to build out the same sort of geometry now of course everything here is a case-by-case -case basis it depends on what you're modeling it depends on how you like to work and what you're comfortable with for me personally the 3d sketches and 3d splines are a cleaner way to do this because you can have all of the guides and the rails for your loft in a single sketch you could even go a bit crazy and do all of the major curves for the body in a single sketch and that obviously cleans things up quite a bit projecting them in 2d sketches into a 3d sketch is easier in general to control the splines and to control the inputs however it does mean for every 3d curve you're going to have to have three 2d sketches and for that that means for a surface like this where we had five curves that we used we needed to have 15 sketches to make that happen so it's a different workflow and sometimes you can combine one and the other to make it work but it does take a bit of practice and there are some restrictions things like doing arcs with tangency in 3d i still don't think work very well but if you are using exclusively splines especially fit point splines those can be relatively easy to control in 3d with a little bit of practice so at this point if you have any questions please let me know as always thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one